All right, welcome back to Biomechanics Lab. In this video, we're going to cover the shoulder joint. This is chapter five in your textbook. Again, kind of like the last chapter, um, there's a, if you read the chapter and you kind of look into this, there's a lot of really, really detailed, specific items. Um, you don't really need to know all that. It's not worth trying to memorize that. What we need to do is develop a really good understanding of kind of the, the basic things um, that you can apply to other classes because that's what they want us to do. Um, in the last chapter when we went over chapter four I really didn't go over any of the nerves. Um, we may cover a little bit of that in class but the major thing we want to understand are the bones and the muscles. Now in the last video we covered the shoulder girdle and if you need more review on that go look at that material again but basically with the shoulder girdle we were looking at more isolated movements of really the scapula and the actual degree to which the arm was moving was very small. Um, the arm did move um, but the main thing that was moving and that we focused on was the scapula and actually here's a view of the scapula right here. When we talk about the shoulder joint itself we're talking now about movements of the entire arm. Okay so for example um, I'm going. I'm kind of skipping ahead here, but these are some of the kind of movements we're talking about. We didn't see any of these when we were looking at the shoulder girdle, but these are specifically movements of the shoulder joint. Flexion, extension, adduction, abduction. We've even got some others that we're going to look at. Um, now, I want to be perfectly clear about this joint. When we're talking about, when I say gross movements of the arm, we are not talking about actually bending the elbow. Okay, the elbow joint is a separate joint. So you'll notice that for all of these movements, um, between flexion, extension, abduction, adduction, there is no change in the bending or the angle of the elbow. Okay, notice here his elbow is 90 degrees, but it stays 90 degrees. Okay, here his elbow is at 180, it stays at 180. So the elbow is not actually bending. It can be bent, it just cannot change its angle. That would be a movement of the elbow joint. We're only looking at the shoulder joint itself. Okay, so we kind of hit some of this in the last video, but here is the anterior view of the scapula. This is actually anatomically the right side. Um, if we're talking about the subject or patient. This is the clavicle, which we know is going to connect basically to the sternum. It also connects to the scapula. And then we have right here this glenoid cavity or glenoid fossa, which is where the head, or they call it the humeral head here, the head of the humerus attaches. And from this, we can get movement of the arm itself through the shoulder girdle, okay? So we have right here, um, this is the head of the humerus. This is actually what is going to fit into the glenoid fossa of the shoulder itself or the, or the scapula. Um, this, remember the humerus is a long bone and then it's going to end basically in these epicondyles right here, the medial epicondyle and the lateral epicondyle. Okay, The lateral epicondyle is basically going to connect to the radius. The medial is going to connect to the ulna. All right, let's take a look at some of the muscles. I'm going to jump down right here to this table. We have first the anterior muscle. So we have the pectoralis major, which is a fairly large muscle. It's divided into upper and lower fibers. We have the subscapularis and the coracobrachialis. Let's find those. So most of you probably know where the pectoralis major is. That's your chest muscle. But we also have the subscapularis, which is this muscle right here, and the coracobrachialis which is this muscle right there where I'm pointing, okay? Those are gonna be your anterior muscles in the shoulder joint. We also have what are called superior muscles. Superior muscles are kinda of, kind of gonna be on the top, and pretty much we're just gonna have three regions of the deltoid, anterior, middle, and posterior fibers, but the deltoid is what's gonna sit basically on top of your shoulder, and the supraspinatus. All right, so let's kind of look at that. This right here is the supraspinatus, um, and then this is the deltoid muscle right here. You can see the deltoid is more lateral, and the supraspinatus is closer to the midline. That is going to be more medial. But you can see these are superior muscles because they're going to sit on top of the shoulder joint itself. Okay, And then the last group are going to be the posterior muscles. We have the latissimus dorsi, the teres major, 
teres minor, those kind of go together, major and minor, and the infraspinatus. Let's see if we can find those. So right here on your back, this very large muscle is going to be the latissimus dorsi. Um, right here you can see the teres major. The teres major is going to be the inferior muscle of the two. And the teres minor is going to be superior to that. And then even superior to that, we have the infraspinatus. Okay. So one thing that you should be prepared for on a quiz um, over this stuff is perhaps um, for a set of muscles, say like the posterior muscles, um, which one is the most superior, which one is the most inferior. Um, I could even say on something like this, true or false, the supraspinatus is more lateral. That would be false, it's actually more medial. The, 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 of, the, of the supraspinatus and the deltoid, the deltoid is more lateral. Okay, so be prepared for questions like that. All right, now let's kind of go into the various motions of the shoulder joint. Now remember, like I mentioned previously in all of these, the elbow is not changing angles. Okay, so between flexion, extension, abduction, adduction, notice the elbow does not change its angle. The only thing that's, that's actually moving is the shoulder. Okay, the shoulder joint is what's either moving or rotating, etc. So flexion, remember flexion and extension occur in the sagittal plane. So flexion is basically moving your entire arm forward and then extension is going to be moving it back. Okay. In fact, if you move it too far, sometimes I call that hyperextension, and hyperextensions tend to lead to injury. Okay. Remember that abduction and adduction, nothing's changed. That's movement in the frontal plane. So that's base abduction would be moving your arm away from your midline, but moving it towards your side. Okay. Adduction is going to be basically moving it back toward the midline. Okay. Now, we also have some other movements that we kind of don't really necessarily think of, um, we can have internal rotation and external rotation. So internal rotation is sort of like if you, if you stand up with your humerus by your side, you kind of have to think about anatomy, humerus by your side and your hand stretched forward. Inter internal rotation would be rotating your hand toward your belly. Okay, you can see here his arm probably started off his hand facing you coming out of the screen and then he rotated his hand towards his belly. Okay, that's an internal rotation. Exter external rotation is going to be the opposite direction. It's going to be moving instead of towards your belly actually out um, away from him. Okay, that's external rotation. Notice what's rotating is pretty much the humerus bone. This region right here is what's doing the rotation. The fact that the hand's moving away is just a consequence of the elbow not changing its angle. All right, so I'm going to flip really quickly to a, a video, and this is going to be an exercise. Um, it's really just a shoulder abduction, okay? But just so you can get a visual of this so I can use my um, example here. So just take a quick look at this. Raises begin with the dumbbells in your okay, hands. Okay, so he's doing a shoulder abduction exercise, force. okay? So hopefully you can see what he's doing. The question we want to ask ourselves is which muscles is going to be the agonist and which is going to be, say, an antagonist? Well, we know that what, what motion is being done is abduction. Now, personally, when I think of that, um, that particular exercise, what most people are actually trying to, uh, to hypertrophy, or at least keep in shape, is the deltoid muscle. Okay, And in general, you really don't have to be specific which, with, with which part of the deltoid. But suffice it to say, the deltoid is going to facilitate abduction. In fact, all three regions, anterior, middle, and posterior fibers, facilitate that abduction. So I would probably argue that one of the main muscles that's going to be doing the abduction of the, sh of the shoulder is going to be the deltoid muscle. Okay? Um, if you wanted to put an extra muscle in there, you could also throw in the supraspinatus. It performs abduction. Okay? Now, this question is also going to ask you, what is the antagonist of that movement? Well, I'm going to look in this table, which is in your book, and I'm going to say, well, what, what is going to be the antagonist? Well, the antagonist of, for abduction is probably going to be the something that does adduction. So I'm probably going to say the latissimus dorsi is going to be the antagonist of the deltoid muscle. Okay? In fact, you can see the latissimus dorsi does adduction. Okay. 
And some of these muscles can have more than one antagonist. For example, you can see that the teres major also facilitates adduction. The teres major with latissimus dorsi would be antagonists of, say, the deltoid and the supraspinatus if we consider their abduction movement. Okay, abduction versus adduction. We can't say that abduction is antagonist to extension. We can't say things like that because they don't even occur in the same plane. We need to consider abduction versus adduction, flexion versus extension. Okay. So you're going to have exercises in your lab handout that are going to look at the various exercises, so say a push-up. You need to figure out what muscles are going to be the, ag the agonist for a push-up. Um, and then you'll need to figure out which ones would therefore be the antagonist. Okay, so if for whatever reason you get to a motion that it, the agonist motion is a flexion, the antagonist motion would be muscles that facilitate an extension. Okay, so just think about it like that. Um, this table is in your book. Um, it's not really worth going into all this nitty-gritty detail, but when you go through this assignment, it should help you get a handle on... Um, what the various muscles do. Okay, One of the things you need to look out for on, on a quiz is you need to know um, for at least some of the basic muscles. Like I would say, um, I would say for deltoid, um, if I consider the abduction motion of a deltoid, maybe what the antagonist motion for that is. Um, just things like that. Okay. Also, you need to be familiar with which muscles are actually part of the shoulder joint versus the shoulder girdle, okay? Because your quiz is, you're actually going to have two quizzes. You're going to have one over chapter four, one over chapter five, and you need to know which muscles are part of which group, okay? Um, also know the differences between the shoulder girdle movements and the shoulder joint movements. Shoulder girdle, we're really just looking at motion of the scapula, very, very small movements of the arm, whereas with the shoulder joint, we're looking at much larger movements, movement of the humerus, okay? Also remember this, because this could end up as like a true or false question. The elbow joint does not change angles, okay? If we wanted to do that, we'd have to do a chapter on the elbow joint. We're only looking at the shoulder joint, so the elbow joint has to remain constant, okay? In other words, if we were doing a bicep curl, that's not this chapter. That's not this chapter. Bicep curl is, is, is a movement of the elbow joint, okay? So just keep things like that in mind, okay? Thank you for watching this. Um, good luck next week.